Professor Numbers has kindly agreed to answer some questions. So there are two roving microphones. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and wait for one of the microphones to come to you. But they can't be hard ones. <laughs> so any, any questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, just a simple point of clarification. You said that within the first 20 years after the publication of Origin, almost all naturalists had accepted Evolution. Evolution, but not natural selection? Correct. Could you explain what you mean by that distinction? Well, uh, as I pointed out in the beginning, Charles Darwin had two goals. One was to, is, to destroy the dogma of separate creations, his, his wording. The other was to put forward and have accepted the mechanism of natural selection for evolution. Well, he was immensely successful in his first goal. Uh, in fact, most people who became evolutionists, most scientists, never gave the reason they just started writing that way. But of those Americans, I looked at 80 American scientists, of the ones who left a record of why they became evolutionists, had nothing, to, nobody mentions natural selection. It is that Darwin finally offered a scientific, i.e. naturalistic mechanism uh, for the origin of species. And that was, that, that was compelling because it, it was an embarrassment to many because they had ruled out the supernatural and here right at the heart of the scientific uh, enterprise were miracles. I'm sorry? Did they think it was just random then, without the mechanism of natural selection? What was the? Oh, no, it, it was more random with natural selection. So there were uh, the, view, the viewpoints uh, were across the spectrum. Uh, one that was rarely articulated as precisely as Asa Gray did was theistic evolutionists. Some people just say, uh, you know, I'm a theistic evolutionist, so their friends say, well, Eric is a theistic evolutionist. Uh, which means that they think God was behind it, but they're not going to work out how God was, be was behind this process. Uh, some people thought that, uh, that there was some inner force propelling this. Uh, people called orthogenesists. There were other people, uh, including Darwin, uh, who thought that use and disuse was important. Uh, a, an idea usually associated with the French evolutionist Lamarck, not with, with Darwin. Uh, but Darwin included a host of mechanisms in the origin of species. Um, use, disuse. Oh, well, the direct, the direct impact of the environment, that organisms responded to what was taking place uh, in their surrounding environment. So all these sorts of ideas were percolating simultaneously, as I say, roughly till, uh, till the 1930s. Uh, so then, Neo-Darwinism, so-called Neo-Darwinism, emerges the great synthesis, which one historian has said was really the great constriction, because the most significant development to come out of that was that all these non-selectionist mechanisms got pushed out of biology. Yeah. You've described some of the controversies uh, at the beginning of the last century. Um, do you have any advice from history to offer to scientists today who are dealing with similar controversies on global warming with the naysayers of who think that mammon should prevail there? One word, duck. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a... It, uh, I sh I'm a historian, so what do I know? But uh, 
it's hard to shake people from their prejudices. And uh, there's a, a recently published book in the United States by uh, Naomi Oreskes and a guy named Conway uh, that has demonstrated that many of the leading uh, climate change deniers are the same scientists who were denying that tobacco causes cancer and uh, supported by some of the same organizations. Uh, it's uh, a number, we hear that a number of Christians are, are opposed to the environmental movement generally. Uh, some think it's pagan, you're worshiping nature, hugging trees. Uh, others, although it's very hard to find this articulated in print, uh, who believe in the imminent return of Christ, think that you should spend your time trying to convert the world uh, rather than saving it, because it's not going to be here more than another few years. Uh, but increasingly, uh, Christian voices have spoken out on this issue in favor of taking climate change seriously. Um, organisms, I imagine, must evolve at different speeds. And one of the things is the number of times in a given span at which the, the number of generations that occur within that span. Um, people like uh, humans may have a generation span of, say, 25 years, but germs like bacteria have a, a very short span, perhaps 20, 20 minutes. And one therefore feels that they can evolve very quickly, whereas advanced animals and plants can't. And I just wonder why these microbes don't completely take over the world. I mean, they're, they're trying to do it with, with, by make, becoming resistant to our antibiotics. Um, but um, I wonder if you could perhaps comment on that. Well, I think we're witnessing that with Ebola right now. It's going to take over the world. But your comment prompts me to say something that is a little bit different from what I intended to do, but I can't resist. So. Uh, for a long time, uh, a criticism of especially the young earth creationists who believe life has only been here on earth for six to 10,000 years uh, uh, have said how stupid they were not to recognize that evolution is going on before our own eyes. Uh, well, what so very few of them understand is that once you adopt young earth creationism as opposed to the old earth creationism of Brian and the other fundamentalists in the 1920s, is that you have to have rapid evolution, extremely rapid evolution, by natural selection or any other means. Because uh, as the young earth creationists have been pointing out for 70 years, uh, the issue is not species. It was for Darwin. The issue for Bible believers is kinds. Kinds were created in the Garden of Eden, and kinds were preserved on Noah's Ark. And the Ark and the Flood are crucial elements of, of young earth creationism. So unfortunately, the Bible gives the dimensions of Noah's Ark. And biologists have created an almost infinite number of species. I mean, they just love to create species. So that you can't fit them all on the Ark. Even if you take little ones and eggs, <laughs> you can't get every species on the Ark. And so the young earth creationists have said, but we don't have to because all we need is kinds. 
And so uh, one of them in the early 40s suggested that these kinds, they need a scientific name, uh, called them barriments. Uh, and about 15 years ago, a group of hotshot young creation scientists formed the Barriminology Study Group, the goal of which was to identify scientifically what the originally created kinds and the kinds preserved on Noah's Ark, what they encompass. Well, they released the report. It's now up on a plaque in the Creation Museum in northern Kentucky that the kind is equivalent to the biological family. So all evolution within the family is now, according to the creation, microevolution. So microevolution is welcome, but it goes a lot further than most people, than most scientists would regard microevolution. And then macroevolution is any evolution that goes beyond, and that couldn't take place according, according to this theory. So you have, at the time of the flood, you have one canine pair coming off the ark, and in 4,300 years, that one pair of canines has to produce all the foxes, coyotes, wolves, domestic dogs, hyenas, I don't know, there are probably a bunch of others too. So they have to have, they must have evolution, microevolution, like on fast forward. So they love it when uh, microevolution is demonstrated. And the biologists think they're disproving creationism, but they're actually feeding it. The popular theory of evolution is that beneficial traits that encourage species to survive are passed on. This also brings in the Lamarck theory that uh, giraffes got their long necks from stretching up from t to trees for feeding. Does that mean that the further you live from a bus stop, the longer your legs will grow? <laughs> oh, definitely. I grew up, I grew up in the Tennessee mountains, and, and I and all my fellows, you know, we have one leg a little longer than the other for walking on a mountain. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, Lamarck has been widely misunderstood. Uh, this, uh, this activity, which epitomizes Lamarck in most textbooks, uh, was only a, a minor uh, element in his theory of evolution. He believed that organisms had some plastic force in them that propelled them onward. And he didn't have the branching tree. You had multiple strands of evolution uh, going on with this force inside, pushing them on. Use and disuse played a, played a role, but uh, too many people have reduced Lamarck, Lamarckianism to that use and disuse, uh, so that it becomes kind of a character. Could I ask an entomological question? Yeah, I probably can't answer it, though. <laughs> okay. Francis Bacon once said that there were different sorts of insects in this world. There were insects like ants, which collected loads and loads of little seeds and bits and pieces. And then there were insects like spiders, which made very beautiful webs. And there were insects like bees, which made a very beautiful octagonal um, form and then filled it with the honey that they'd collected. It seems to me that some scientists, and Darwin was amongst those initially, who went out and collected hundreds of thousands of specimens, like the ants, and brought them back. But as such, they weren't terribly useful. There are those people who have wonderful ideas and make beautiful designs like spider's webs, but only, occasion, only some of the things that fly into the spider's web actually stick. And surely we as scientists or theologians or whatever should be like the bees. We should collect the honey, the facts. We should, yes, use our rational thought to make beautiful 
ideas like the spider's web. But at the moment, having studied this quite considerably, I don't think all the facts fit in to the design. And maybe we need to continue like the bees, working very hard to fill the, our octagons with uh, the beauty of what we see around us. Well, I think I like what I hear. Uh, we do, humans, have a conceit in each generation that what they've discovered about nature is the ultimate truth about nature. Uh, as a historian, we look back to any, any period, any century, and you know, by our standards, so much is wrong. And there's no reason for me to believe that that won't continue to be the case, that people 100 years from now will think that things about which we were cocksure uh, didn't deserve that, that kind of recognition. So I fully expect a lot of investigation and change and revision uh, to take place. I'm not sure it'll be as sweet as honey, though. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Can I ask you to reflect on different countries? Because we tend to think of modern creation science as being a very American phenomenon. We're sitting here, of course, in Scotland, and we're aware of the rise of Islamic creation science as well. So uh -huh. I wondered if you could um, tell us what it is about certain places that seem to be more open to this sort of thinking than others. Well, thank you for asking that question. Uh, it just so happens that I edit a series of books for the Johns Hopkins University Press, and just within the past week, we have produced one called Creationism in Europe. And it answers your question. It has about maybe a dozen chapters on uh, every subject that you just mentioned, uh, most of the countries, but on Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy and Islam, uh, as, as well, uh, you're right. Uh, Anti-evolutionism is spreading rapidly uh, around the world, uh, even in, in places in Europe. Uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a great, uh, a great flurry of creationist activity. Uh, for uh, many, many decades, the Islamic world virtually ignored uh, evolution. Uh, the first controversy that broke out was late in the 19th century in a Christian mission school in Lebanon. Uh, and most Muslims didn't, uh, didn't pay any attention to this. Now it's become a topic of great concern, uh, promoted by a Turkish uh, guy. I had the pleasure of spending an evening in his house with him a few years ago. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and he and his followers, cons they're very anti-evolution, consider themselves modern because they're engaging with science. As he points out, you know, most Muslims still don't engage with science. And it's important to get, engage with science. So he's, he's leading the pack there. Uh, and you see throughout Europe uh, evidence of, of his rather dramatic influence. Uh, but it, it varies. In, probably in Western Europe, the country with the most activity over the years has been the Netherlands. And uh, because uh, you know, they have this notion of pillars, religious pillars, and they get an opportunity to promote their views in the public. Uh, and the creationists have taken advantage of that. Uh, uh, so uh, give me a country and I'll tell you. Um, hi, I'm just going back to like how you're answering one of the earlier questions about like the different kinds and how create, some creationists believe it's like um, 
like evolution happened really rapidly, couldn't yeah. you? Like just playing a bit of devil's advocate here, couldn't you argue that, um, like if we take the example of Darwin's goldfinches in the Galapagos, they all come, came from a common ancestor, but now they've developed into different species, even though they still share quite a few of the same characteristics. Couldn't you argue that the same kind of thing ha could have happened with the arc? It's like you have one species of snake and then just all their offspring like developed into their own like you can um into their own like biological niches or anything like that yeah because i mean it's like if you take it literally the whole world will have been destroyed so it's like you know you've got no other species of the kind except for these pair of snakes and then every and then their offspring just all like repopulate their earth basically like couldn't you argue that kind of this is a historical question well, I am a historian, so uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the truth is that I don't know uh, what's possible um, there at, at all. But your question does raise uh, an unexplored part of the history of Darwinism and evolution. And that is, uh, Darwin wants to overthrow the dogma of separate creations. What's the dogma of separate creation? Uh, it's clearly not the Genesis story, because if you, if you accept the Genesis and current creationist story, then uh, the, the uh, animals found on the Galapagos Islands are going to be descendants of those found on the mainland of South America, having come across from Mount Ararat. But he sees this as falsifying the dogma of separate creation. So I think there's a likelihood his friend Charles Lyell believed in centers of creation or foci of creation uh, in a steady state world, not a progressive world. And there, the creator populates these centers uh, and, and puts in uh, organisms that are suitable to that environment, not what's next door, as a creationist would, would assume, as most creationists would assume. So I do think that he must be talking about that. When Asa Gray talks about creationism, he is using a very different point of view associated with his colleague Louis Agassiz. Uh, who, uh, I don't need to go into that. So you have these various creation theories there, and clearly Darwin is not responding to the uh, biblical view anymore, although he thinks that's the dogma. Hey, well, thank you so much. We sure appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.